Well, I want to speak this morning about the vision by design. Vision by design. Did you know, and you do know this, but we're going to take it farther, that there's only one of you. Just one. There's no one like you. Do you know that there's no city like Oshawa? There's no region like Durham. There's no church like Embassy. There's no nation like Canada. Now, there are other nations, and you can see different flags and insignias of, of that nation. And there might be some nations that are like Canada, but there's only one Canada. There might be some people who are like us, but there's no one who is just like you. And one of the secrets is to discover and celebrate who you are and not become a photocopy of someone else. And the other is to just open up that design and what is the vision of who we're supposed to be. I want to share a couple of things this morning that will set just the next few weeks ahead of us and uh, then even throughout this year, to be able to look at vision by design. We're going to uh, be going into the scriptures. I want to look at a portion of scripture this morning that will be a, a template or a, 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 a launching place for us to discover what it is to have a vision that's specifically customized with you in mind. In fact, one of the great verses of the Bible that speaks of gifts and abilities and supernatural endowments for what we do is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And it says that God the Holy Spirit gives to each person as Holy Spirit chooses. Now, in, in just a couple of, of weeks, we'll be having our Easter weekend. We're having a Good Friday service. And for that, that Good Friday service, it'll be right here, 10 o'clock. We'll have communion. I'll be sharing a, a message about Good Friday, about the death of, of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. We're taking up an offering, especially for our media. By the way, you should notice a difference in the sound. We've got a, a digital board now that allows us to look after the sound in, in a, a, a better way. And so for about two weeks now, you should have had a, a little better sense of sound. We're going to have an offering, special offering, going towards the media and all the different components of things that we're purchasing there. And then the next day is Easter, or biblically it's called Passover. And that's Sunday morning. And so we want you to bring people to church who don't know Jesus. Uh, there are some people who say, every time I go to church, all I hear is an Easter message. Well, that's because you only go to church at Easter. Okay? And so people, people are open, you know, at Christmas time or Easter time. Uh, they wouldn't normally go to church, but, you know, Easter time they will. We're asking you to catch the vision and to invite people to come out for our Sunday Easter service. Usually Good Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, more Christians come and in the city, if other churches aren't having a Good Friday service, then, you know, we, we come together. And so we'll be having a Good Friday service here. But Sunday, Sunday morning, there'll be kind of a special media presentation. Not, not a full drama like we usually have, but it will be with special music, media. I'll be ministering the word at the end. And it's specifically to be uh, able to invite people to come to Christ. We want them to know the Lord. And it, it's the kind of, of uh, message and service that will resonate with people. And so that's a service that's designed for that outcome. Then the following week, we have our Global Canada Conference. And we'll have scores and scores of people, 50-plus people, uh, specific leaders from all across Canada, who are converging here at the embassy in Oshawa for the conference, it begins Thursday morning for those leaders who are coming from all, all across Canada. Some have national ministries, some have provincial ministries, some local and so forth. They'll be joining us, and at 9.15, I'll be meeting with them all day, 9.15 to about 
5 o'clock. And then our first Global Canada conference speaker is on that night. And that's our first public meeting that night. And that's Thursday night, all day Friday, all day Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Randy Clark, Sunday night, Blaine Cook. It's, it's the whole weekend. And our desire is you're going to see people healed. Usually in a crowd like this, you'll, you'll see several hundred people healed by the power of God. And you'll have a touch in your own life, ministries that, that are changed because of presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking for you to register online or go to the information center and register, sign up. I'm telling you, it will be worth it. We have three speakers, Randy Clark, his associate, Tom Jones, the one who doesn't sing, and Blaine Cook. And uh, each of those uh, folk will be with us. But we're hosting here at Embassy, we're hosting this national conference. Why isn't it in Win uh, uh, this conference at Winnipeg? Why isn't it in Charlottetown? Why isn't it in Vancouver? Why is it at the embassy? And that's a good question. In Oshawa? Well, you see, it's vision by design. Why do we do some things that other churches don't do? Why do other churches do things that we don't do? Well, it's vision by design. So that when you look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, when you look at what the scripture says about the church, it's called the manifold wisdom of God. When it's by design. When it's just us all doing things, then we've lost the design and we've lost the wisdom of God. I want you to turn in your Bible, please, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. It's pretty uh, quick to find the scripture. Genesis chapter 2. And I want to look at a couple of portions of scripture so that we can catch the design. Did you know that God in his dealings with human beings will choose the time frame that they live. I think it's pretty safe for me to say that no one here this morning was born in 300 B.C. It's pretty safe. You weren't born during the Greek era. You weren't born in 2000 B.C. during the Egyptian time. I wasn't born in 300 A.D., I wasn't even born in the 1700s. You weren't born in the 1800s. There's a time frame that we're born into. That's part of the design of God. You fit into 2015. You fit into that. Not only that, and no matter where your geographical or biological birth stems from, you, you know that we have people here from all over the world. But here you are at the embassy in Oshawa in March 2015. Is God part of that? Yes. It's vision by design. There des there's a design for us to be able to be at this time, in this place, in this city, in this country. That's where you're to function. The scripture speaks of the design of Adam and Eve. Their place was the Garden of Eden. That's where God put them. And by the way, there were several thousands of people who were born after Adam and Eve were created and formed. But their design was to function in the Garden of Eden. In the same, and by the way, Eden means pleasure or delight. It's your sweet spot. There's a design of what you're to function in. Sometimes we want to put people in certain areas and have them do certain things, but there's a design. Bible says train up a child in the way that he or she should go, and when they're old they won't depart from it. Usually we misunderstand what that verse is about in Proverbs, and we, we think that it means train them up in the ways of God, which we should do. There are other places in the Bible that say that. But this is, find out the natural bent of your child 
and train them up in that way. Don't try to make your musician son into a football player. Don't try to make your athletic daughter into a physicist. There is a, a natural, God-given design and bent for every person, whether you're young or old. There's a pleasure that we find when we're in that vision. And so Adam and Eve found themselves in the garden of pleasure, the garden of delight. It's what you enjoy doing. And to think if you could, in this life, actually do it and be paid for it, wouldn't that be great? Some people say, I can't wait till I retire until I can do what I really want to do. That's not a great way to live. Why not find the design that God has for you now? And to be able to do what you're designed to do. It's the vision for design. Keep your finger, actually you don't have to because you can turn back to Genesis 2 anytime you want. That's easy. But in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, I want to give you some scripture for what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, it says this. And God has made from one blood, that is from Adam and Eve, God has made from one blood, Every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. There's a place and there's a time. The time is 2015. The place is in Canada. The place is Ontario. The place is Durham Region or Toronto or GTA, we have people who come from different parts of this whole area. It's your boundary. There's a design for you in each of these specific areas. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8, the scripture says it again, only this particular verse, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8 is very interesting because it tells us that somehow the design, if you really check uh, this particular portion of Scripture out, 32 and verse 8, the design centers around the nation of Israel. Sometimes people wonder, what is it about Israel, besides them being God's chosen people, what is it that things that happen in Israel affect the whole world? Well, it's because there's a design. There's a connection. In 32 and 8, it says this, and I'll... I'll read the whole verse. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, that is when God divided nations their inheritance, when he separated uh, the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. So God has distributed nations. There are nations in Europe that aren't provinces in Canada. They're in Europe. There are nations in Asia, the Pacific Rim. There are nations in South America. We have nations that are distributed. You say, well, you know, just, uh, it, it's kind of whimsical. It's arbitrary. No, it's not. Some people, your life was changed when you moved from your nation to Canada. Your life dramatically changed. Probably there was a greater opportunity. Not necessarily, but probably. Because there's something special about Canada. That's why sometimes we'll say there's something about Canada as it relates to even the last days. It's the timing, it's the place, and all of that sort of thing. And so you'll find this in your own life. We're to live by design. Now, I want us to see something that I think, uh, I'm, I just want to keep it simple because it is so simple to see this. But I want to show us something that's absolutely profound. Uh, if, if you get this, and it wouldn't be your fault, I, I want to say it clearly. But if you get this, it can change your life. You'll never forget it the rest of your life. It begins in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. And it says this. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. Speaking of God creating the heavens and the earth, he creates for six days, then on the seventh day, he rests. 
And the scripture says this in verse 5 of chapter 2. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. Here's something that's very interesting. It begins with rest. The seventh day God rested, not because he was tired, but because Sabbath, or rest, always identifies God is about to do something important. And so he's designed a Sabbath. When you lose your Sabbath, you're no longer walking in the supernatural of God. Profound truth. When you lose your Sabbath, your rest, you're no longer walking in the supernatural of God, but it's something that we just, you know, keep going and doing and try to do ourselves. Here, God institutes a Sabbath. He does it, which is remarkable, not because he's tired, but he's laying a template or a prototype of what he wants to have happen in the years ahead for us. And the scripture says this, God wouldn't allow a seed to be planted or a shrub to be planted or rain to come until there was a person who would work. That's the last part of verse 5, and it's what verse 5 is talking about. There wouldn't be any rain. There wouldn't be any planting in the field. There wouldn't be any herb in the field. Nothing would grow. Why? Because there was no man to till the ground. God is so big that he can do it all by himself. But he doesn't. He pulls himself back and he says, I'm waiting for man. The key piece to this to understand is, we often say that work is one of the products of sin. In actual fact, that's not true. We're going to define it more carefully and get an understanding of this. But before Adam and Eve ever sinned, Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, God has designed that there would be man, and I'm speaking uh, inclusively now, male and female. God has designed man to work. On the, and until he finds a man or creates a man, he doesn't even plant a seed. He doesn't even allow something that could be planted to grow. And he doesn't water it because he waits for a person who would be willing to work. Now, let me give you, just jump into the New Testament to give you an example of this. Because you would know this. It's just that now we're getting a little better insight of it. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35, 36, 37, 38. Scripture speaks... Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. This is the principle and the grid that we're working on. God says there are all sorts of things that I want to do. But until you're willing to co-work and co-labor with me, I can never do it. And in fact, because it would be so dysfunctional, I won't even let rain fall on it. I won't. I'll hold back the rain because I want to co-labor, co-work with you. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. God says, I won't do anything yet until I find a worker. Well, he never created a worker, so we needed a worker to be created. Turn to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, please. The scripture says this. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. This is before Eve was created. Taken out of Adam and built, as the Bible says. This is before Eve was even created. Scripture says that God put the man in the garden to tend it 
and to keep it. The word tend is the same word in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5, where it says to till the ground, to tend the ground, to work the ground. It actually is speaking here that when Adam is created, now God is about to have seeds grow, plants bear fruit, and we're going to shift into a watering system. Why? Because he's got a worker. Where there is no work, we can pray all day. I could preach and perspire up here and, and you know, huff and puff and bluster, but until there is work, you will not see God sending the rain for fruitfulness. That's the principle. Pray that there'd be labors. The harvest is great, but the labors are few. That's what Jesus says. That's the principle that he's working on. And so, Adam is told this before even Eve comes. Adam's told this. I want you to work this ground. And I want you to, the, the word is abad, A-B-A-D. That's the Hebrew word. He's, uh, verse 15. To tend it or till it or work it and to keep it. Shamar is the Hebrew word for to keep it. S-H-A-M-A-R. God says, I want you to protect it. I want you to care for it. I want you to watch over it. I don't want you to be irresponsible with the design that's upon your life. I don't want you to be negligent with who you are. Because there's only one of you and you fit into the whole of the mosaic. And so Adam is told to work it and to guard it. Now here's what's interesting. There's no sin yet. There's no sin yet. Eve is just, you know, she's formed just a few verses later after Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. And so now the two of them as a family are supposed to have a vision by design. Do some things in this garden because you'll find your pleasure here. It's before sin ever happened. And you'll get into your sweet spot. And in fact, this word that I was telling you about, a bad, for work or toil, not toil, pardon me, it's, um, it's the word for till. This particular word here, in chapter 2, verse 5, Chapter 2, verse 15, actually has in it the idea that once you begin to work with God in this way and enjoy his presence and actually work, that your work is no longer work, but one of the words for this is worship. That's the word. It also means worship. It's now you're doing something that you really enjoy doing. In other words, there's no burnout attached to it. Somebody says, why do you do what you do? Oh, I just love it. I look at Rob McMurtry. Day in, day out, Sunday after Sunday with his team, doing ushering. There's an order to all that's happening. There can be burnout if, if you, you know, you just say, well, I'm just doing it because i got to do it. And kids are notorious for that. Could you please take out the garbage? Oh, I'm so sick today. It's killing me. I hate garbage. I hate garbage bags. I hate blue boxes. I hate green boxes. Oh, I hate it. What if? And here's the breakthrough. What if somebody said, you know, every time you take the garbage out, Jesus smiles? What? You mean Jesus cares about, you know, if we do something, whatever you do, do it as what? Unto the Lord. Yeah. You see, now, now we've turned our work into worship. Now we're saying, Lord, I'm on board. This changes the whole thing. This is a game changer. Now it's not, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. I've been one of those Christians before. Not a good one. I've, I've met those kind of Christians before in other churches, not here.
Yeah, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Yeah, so-and-so wants me to do it. I don't like doing it, but somebody's got to do it. I can't wait to get out of this thing. Well, is that your design? Is that your place? Is that what God's gifted you to do? Did Holy Spirit put you there? And is it overlapping and connecting with other people's lives, with Adam and Eve and, and, and all of the others? Then why don't you turn the work into worship? And say, Lord, I just love doing this. I do it as unto you. Now, we don't have to tell people, I'm not doing it for you, I'm doing it for Jesus. <laughs> I bet those kind too. If you thought I was doing it to you, you can forget it. I wouldn't do it for you, but I'll do it for Jesus. Oh, I feel better now. That's good. That really encouraged me. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Now, it's, we found our work and the design and our place. And now, the work has slid into worship. This is literally what it's saying here. You say, well, there's something I'm not getting. And that's good because I didn't get it either. You have to look at this closely. You say, well, I thought when Adam and Eve sinned and they lost the design that one of the curses was that they would have to work. Well, it's half true, but the other half is what opens up the understanding of this. In Genesis chapter 3, they've sinned. Verse 23, it says this. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So Adam and Eve are sent out of the Garden of Eden and part of the, the curse and the being thrust out of the garden is that now they would have to till, and it's the same word as Genesis 2 and 5 and Genesis 2 and 15, that have to work the ground. And you say, see, it's part of the curse. Work is curse. No, no. You see, there is the work that is worship and is easy and it's who we are and we love to do it. It's our passionate spot. It's the authentic place. It's all of that. And then there is the work of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 23 that's described to us in verse 17 of chapter 3. And it says this. I'll read the whole verse. Then to Adam God said, this is after they sinned, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, by the way, that, don't take that out of context. Um, I can see some men trying to get mileage out of that. That's all you'll hear. And have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Here it is. There's a work that's toil and it'll wear you out. And unfortunately, it, that understanding and that practice has slipped into the church. And so we talk about people toiling for Jesus. And I, I'm, I'm making a, a generalizing here, a generalizing statement. There is a toil that has come with the fall of man. And it's, I'm going to get up early, and I'm going to go to bed late, and I'm going to worry myself sick, and I'm going to work my backside off, and I'm going to work 70 or 100 hours a week, and this is how you get ahead. And we say, that's what it is to work, and here are the reasons why I do it. And that is working under the curse. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we move from working with toil to working and it being our worship. You say, well, I'm supposed to be doing the job that I am doing now, and I've hated it up to now, but I really feel that I'm to be there. Well, then, do it as unto the Lord. Do you know that'll shift from night to day? It'll change the whole thing. You say, I I've always loved doing this, but... I just, you know, I just kept on doing it. And, well, what if you realized, well, this is what the Lord wants me to do. This is what I do. I meet people all the time in this house who, who never want to see a stage like this. I, I meet, meet people, too, too, who want to be up here lots. You get both. 
And that it doesn't have to be ego. It's just different giftings and so on. But there are people who say, I never want to get up there. But I'll, I'll give you my life to make sure everything happens. It's behind the scenes. It's all happening. You'll never hear about them. Their work has become their worship. The integration of church, kingdom, and life. It's all there. Faithfully, they serve the Lord. Why? Because it's not work. It's their worship. It's just what they do for the Lord. It's what they do for the body of Christ. They found their Garden of Eden. They found their place of pleasure. They're connected with other people. That's what it is. Scripture speaks of a place where the toil is taken away. And the work is there. In fact, I'll even use this expression. Some of you have heard me say this before, but I, in our home, you'll hear it lots. So I'll say, I'm tired. I'm really tired. I've been working hard, but it's good tired. And I'll sit down and I'll go, ah. And then there's the bad tired. And it's, I don't know, I wasted my time. And I did this, this, and I don't know, I don't even do that well and that. And it's bad tired, I call it. You see, one is work with toil, and the other is work with worship. I'll tell you the one that's blessed. Now, God is gracious. He'll let rain fall on the just and the unjust, and, you know, mercy drops will fall on a lot of things that we do. But if you want to find this place that's been spoken of here, and really, it relates to all that we do. It's the place where we say, Lord, I want to know who I am. I want to know what I do well. I want to connect with other believers in the body. And I want to be synchronized in this way. And I want to work. Because as soon as we begin to work, all of a sudden, the seed grows the plant blossoms and bears fruit. The rain comes. You say, well, how'd that happen? Oh, it's because God waits for man to work. You can pray all day, but until you work, you won't see God kick in in that way that we're talking about. It's just a fact. One of the things that we know, I address it differently than some pastors do or leaders do, but we know that in the church of Jesus Christ, there's consumerism. And it's, listen, I'm going to show up on Sunday, and I hope you've got something good for me. Because I've been working all week, and I came to rest and be refreshed and, you know, deliver a good show. Well, you see, that's not the church of Jesus Christ. Neither do we want you toiling. Here, I'll give you another story that comes to my mind. John was to learn a lesson. John writes about it. He was to learn a lesson in John chapter 20 on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And John and Peter and James, they're all good fishermen. They know how to catch fish. fish. But God wants to teach a lesson. So John goes out fishing. And they fished and something all night. What? Toiled. All night and caught. Oh, come on. How can you catch nothing? These guys are good. It's because there's a lesson here. There's a lesson. They toiled all night. God doesn't want you toiling all night. He doesn't. Jesus says this. Why don't you cast your net on the other side of the boat? Well, you think, well, how wide is a boat? Last time I saw a fish, they move around, and you know, you think, what's this about? It's because it's a principle. So they cast their net on the other side of the boat, and their work is turned into worship. Why? Because they're doing what God says to do. So you can do it one way, where you burn yourself out, and you toil, and toil, and you, you just say, this work has killed me, but I'm going to do it. Another way is, my work is my worship. Why should it burn you out when you're doing what you've been designed to do? 
I like buying parts for a car or, or a vacuum cleaner or a juicer or a, what, what do they call silver bullets or, you know, if you drink this, it'll make you look like myself or something like that. You know, you really don't compliment me when you laugh when I talk that way or, or that laugh either. But I love it when they say that, you know, we can re just give you this part and, and this thing will go forever. I love hearing that, forever. You know, you, once you have this part in it, you, you can just push down and it'll shake it up and you'll drink and, you know, until you're 100 years old. I said, thank you, I'll take one of those. That's what God says about his church. And I, I have some ideas, but it doesn't matter of how we've slid into something different. And we thought it was just a little shift, but in fact, one of the greatest things is it took us away from who we are. We often think of sin as uh, robbing a bank, maybe, uh, you know, doing uh, drugs and selling drugs to kids and so on, and that, that would be. But, you know, the actual word where it's used in Scripture when it says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The word sin there is to miss the mark. To come short of the glory of God. Glory means the identity that God, the recognized identity that God gave to it. In other words, if God were to look at you or me today, and he says, this is, you, you know, when you came out of heaven's uh, uh, press uh, as a person, when you came out, this is who I designed you to be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were like that? And so coming short of that is when we become something else. So what God's saying is this. It's especially in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. I want you to work the ground and I want you to carefully observe it. Some versions say serve and protect. It's interesting that that's what uh, police sometimes have on the, the side of their, their police vehicle. Serve and protect. I'm here to serve. I'm here to work. I'm here to offer my worship in this way. This is who I am. I love it when people come into church and they say, listen, this is who I am. I want you to know me in this way and I want to pitch in here. Or someone says, I've been burnt out for, uh, you know, for five or seven years. Then just sit there and get unburned. And as soon as you're better, we want to find out where you are. And don't start working like a slave again. Begin to function in the body and begin to do it as part of your worship. You say, but if I don't work like a slave, I might not get the results. I can promise you, you won't. You'll get better results. Because now you're working under the principle of worship and Sabbath. It's interesting that in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, the scripture says this, that there is a putting of Adam into the garden. But you come down in Scripture to verse 15. And the word put in our English versions is used again. Two different Hebrew words for put. In verse 8, God just puts Adam into the garden, places him there. In verse 15, God puts Adam in the Garden of Eden. And the word put there means for peace and safety. Let me just say that in another way. He places you, God does, that you think, you know, I love doing this. We have people in the worship team that are like that. They say, I love to be in the worship team. Some people say, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I'm not able to play my instrument every Sunday. I could do this all the time. Peace and rest. I love doing this. Sometimes we're, thought, uh, we're taught in the secular realm, motivation. We're taught passion. We're taught how to succeed. We're taught how to get it faster, bigger, and all of that. But one thing that we're often not taught is how to do it God's way. God's way. And it's you, when God wants to teach you a lesson, uh, a lesson, he'll say, 
you can go and catch fish, but you can toil all night and catch nothing. He says, I want to show you another way. I want to readjust things. And as we come into that place of the vision by design, why did I mention Good Friday? Because it's a service. We come together. There'll be people who will prepare the Lord's table. There'll be ushers. There'll be greeters. There'll be musicians. There'll be someone who speaks. There'll be music. We give an offering. We say, well, you know, you take up an offering. Why do you take up an offering? It's all part of our work. It's my worship. Easter. Our Easter service. We want to win souls. Well, didn't we hire you to do that? Actually, you never. I'm doing what I do as my worship to the Lord. We're going to win souls. Well, how are we going to win souls? Well, you're going to have to work. Man, that's, that's like eating a rat sandwich when you say that to people who are consumers. What? I, went, I, went, I, I can just hear people at, at uh, Montana's and Milestone's and uh, Swiss LA. You hear somebody two tables over. Yeah, I went to church this morning. The pastor said how great we all are. And we just said how good his message is. And we all walked out. And it was a great morning. And you say, uh, yeah, I went to, work this, uh, went to church this morning. And the pastor told us, get to work. Biblically, yeah. It's you carry something. There's, there's a design, a wisdom attached to your life, a vision that's unique. There's nobody like you. Nobody. You say, well, I could do it alone. Not like God designed it. It's the wisdom of God. That's why even, you know, we can say, well, we hired Pastor Craig to do dramas at Christmas time. Pastor Craig, do the drama, get the people to the front, get them saved, and also get all the people coming who don't know Jesus. No, no. The message that we're sharing here in this biblical context, and I don't want to make light of it, but it's, guys, let's all get to work. This is consuming our lives. One reason is because we're going to give an account to the Lord with what we had and how we did it but not in a fear base. Once, once we begin to do what God's designed us to do, we'll say, I want to do it again. You teach children how to do something, how to ride a bike, and you'll have to begin to tell them, you know, stay in our own block. They want to go to another block. Why? Because they love it so much. There is a place in God where the work that burned and toiled and just, you know, totally, you know, wars out. There's a place in God that actually produces more, allows us to do more. In fact, people, people know this, that happy people produce more than sad people. Well, I've got news for you. I can ramp it up higher than that. People who make their work their worship and recognize that who they are is part of a bigger picture and when it's integrated with others, it's no longer just a musician on the stage. It's part of the whole for the Lord. It's no longer I'm part of the embassy family, but it's part of the whole. Watch out when that body, that family of people begin to function in that way. Watch out. I want you to stand with me, please. I purposely made some notes for this morning. Good Friday service, just show up. That's pretty good, eh? Unless you're an usher. Unless you're a musician, part of our worship team. Unless you're a pastor, show up. Why? Because it's what we're going to do together. Easter Sunday, bring someone who doesn't know Jesus. It's part of our work. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers. Think about that. Laborers, workers, doing the Lord's work. Do you know that when my parents were in the ministry, they were called Christian workers? That's what they called them back in those days. Biblically, it's correct. 
So Easter, we, we want to we wanna plan toward that. We, we want people to come out. Uh, you know, they say, well, I, you know, I'll go to church with you, but just because it's Easter, that's fine. Just come this Easter. It's designed for that purpose. Just shortly after that, we have our Global Canada Conference. There are cities all across the nation that would love to host what we host. Got to register. Got to be there. Be a part of it. Be hungry. I want more of God. I want God to touch me. I want to be a part of that. Do you know that we need people? And it's not because there's a shortage. There's Literally, there's no shortage from any other year. Last I heard, even on Friday, the, the names were coming in of, of different things that we needed. But I wanted to mention so that we could see the, the multifaceted opportunities for our work. We need billets for some people who are flying in. They're, they're paying for their flight, their food, their, uh, the registration for the conference. They need a place to stay. They need to be billeted. They're Christian workers coming in from all over the country. We need people who will give themselves to hospitality, people serving them lunch, supper, bite to eat at breakfast, coffee breaks, all that sort of thing. There's so much running around in all of those things. We need people who serve. It's just serving, work. By the way, that's another word for till or work or worship. It's serve, to be a servant, to serve. We need people who will be willing to be involved in transportation. Somebody says, you know, I, um, I'm not real good at hospitality, but I could drive a, a vehicle. We have all sorts of other miscellaneous things that are, are part of that. Hosting a conference, being here. Some people come on Sunday. We've already finished Thursday night, all day Friday, Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night. We hit Sunday and some people never, and they're part of this embassy and people have flown in from all over the nation. They've never been a part of what we were experiencing from God. There are places all over the world that have guest speakers come and, 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 and they, they feel so privileged. We have them come to embassy. It's Lord, we're hungry, we want more. It's Lord, we'll do, if, if we're not, if we're not to do this and it's just toil, then we don't want to do that, right? Because that's just toil. But if this is our DNA, if this is the design of who we are, if we're to reach our city and the Durham region, if that's what we're supposed to do, then we want to do that too. God will give us the grace for it. All through this year, there are opportunities. Actually what it is, it's a church family that embraces ownership, embraces a happiness of doing work that's turned into worship, and actually says, can't wait to do more because this doesn't burn me out. It actually gives me more passion for Jesus. Is that not the place where we want to be? Am I describing something that, yes, absolutely. I close with this. There are people who have toiled all night. I use that as an expression. And for whatever reason, you can feel worn out. You can feel frazzled. People give different names for it. Burned out. What, whatever it would be. I just want to give a blessing of grace to you this morning. Maybe just with every head bowed. There are as, as there are people here this morning, every head bowed, if that's you and you just say, you know, I, I've been toiling, that's not because I'm under the curse, but whatever you've gone through and, and you've just toiled and Jesus can turn it around for you because once we begin to work God's way, we find all of the fruitfulness as well. If that's you, put up your hand because I want to pray for you specifically. Specifically this morning, all across the auditorium, people who have toiled. You've worked hard. It's been tough going. Father, I pray this way because there's a grace that you can give. There's a grace. There's a mercy 
there, there's a, an oil that can come on these folk. We bless them. Sometimes the finest people go through an experience of that. So we bless you in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. And that in all of your toil, you discover that it can be worship and no longer it'll be a, it would it be a burnout, but it, instead it would be just a fire burning in you that's the burning bush. That was the lesson for Moses. That it would be a bush that wouldn't be consumed. It would be a fire burning in the bush. I pray that for each of these people in Jesus' name. Let there be a difference from this service onward. A difference. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, on these people. Come right now, Holy Spirit. Touch them in Jesus' name. Touch them in the name of Jesus. Let the power of God flow through their lives. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. John 20 keeps coming. You've toiled all night. Maybe you've got some things, but you have yet to see what the Lord will do when you're resting in Him. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for all of us here this morning. You want to raise us up as workers, not as slaves, not as servants, but as sons and daughters who find it their joy to work with their their elder son, uh, the elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, and their heavenly Father, and in the power of Holy Spirit. And I say, Lord, that there would be a shift in a turnaround, a shift in a turnaround, not in what we do so much or in all things, but in how we do it. And that th there would be a unity to such a degree in the spirit realm where we would embrace and be responsible in serving and caring for all that you've given to us. The things that we're to do, the, the, the DNA that we carry, the wisdom of design and vision that you've planted in this house. I'm going to ask you to do something this morning that's more than talking to me. But if that's your heart, to, to fall in line and to open it up and say, Lord, I'm available here. Just tell the Lord right now. Just tell the Lord, I'm, I'm available. I'm, I'm locking in. I'm, I'm going to allow my life to be used in a way like never before. I give myself to you. The wisdom of His design. The wisdom of who you are. You will never miss God by walking this way. You'll never miss God. How could we when we give ourselves to the design that He has chosen? We pray that for embassy. We pray that for our nation for such a time as this. We pray for our conference. We pray for, for those who would give themselves to prayer. For those who would invite sick people to come. Those to invite those who are unsaved in Jesus' name. We bless Marilyn Brooks who's going to speak next Sunday. We thank you that that's, that's her sweet spot. That's her Eden. That's her pleasure. We bless her as she prepares to minister to this house. I bless people who are behind the scenes. I thank you, Lord, for those who work so hard. They've never asked for any exposure. There's no grumping. There's no complaining. But behind the scenes, they do so much. We bless them. We bless them. We bless them. We bless them. Because you're putting your body together to function the way that it's supposed to function. When we see all these things, we'll give you the glory. You the praise. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.